You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brook. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brook, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show, or maybe a gratitude nugget, how you can become a gratitude believer, and one to three takeaways maybe from today's show. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google or any other places that you get podcasts. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I really appreciate that. And also, people ask me about the gratitude journals a lot. To purchase a gratitude journal or to find out more about my gratitude speaking, coaching, one-on-one and group coaching, you can connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com. And also, as you can see in the background, thatgratitudeguy.com will get you there as well. So let me get on with the show and introduce you to my guests. I'm excited to have my this week's guest, Diane McClay. Diane McClay is the founder of the Choice and Courage Company and is a personal empowerment and transformation coach to mid-level professional women who aspire to lead from and live with more meaning and purpose. Diane connects women to their inner power and higher levels of self-leadership by creating awareness, leveraging choice, and taking courageous action. By the way, her two favorite words, choice and courage. She'll be talking about that in a second. She is a contributing author to the international bestselling book, Dreaming Big, Being Bold, Volume 4, inspiring stories from trailblazers, visionaries, and changemakers, and is known by her compassionate optimism, strategic yet-to-be-out-of-the-box thinking, and unique connection to nature and storytelling. Diane hosts two radio shows on Transformation Talk Radio in the Cornelia Stephanie Media Group. Diane, welcome to the podcast. Hey, great. Hey, David, how are you? Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, wow, I got uh, to shorten my uh, introductory bio a little bit. That's a lot of things going on I don't on there. know. I like, I like the listeners to know uh, who they're listening to and some of the impressive credentials. So I, I always start with the same thing. Tell the listeners how you and I met. Man, it feels like we've known each other for a lifetime. Uh, Six months ago, you and I basically bumped into each other in the Cornelia Stephanie Media Group. We both said yes to Cornelia Stephanie, uh, who is our media coach and mentor on Transformation Talk Radio. Uh, She brought us both in because she saw things in us that we had to offer the world that felt would fit into the Transformation Talk Radio family, their brand, the network, and also what she's trying to do on the new earth by raising the vibrancy of other people around them. Uh, That's how you and I met. But honestly, David, every time we talk, it feels like uh, we're old friends just catching up. Like, like we've had 60 years of a friendship. Uh, that's what it feels like to me. So yeah, no, how I, we met in a previous life, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure we did. You never know. And I'm, I'm a big believer in previous lives. I always run across the street, even if I see a car about a mile away and a friend says to me, I think you got hit by a car in an earlier life. <laughs> I go, yeah, the I car's coming, the- goes, it's a mile. So Maybe I, I was think, driving the car. It I don't know. Too. I think that could have been the case. So <laughs> yes. And you know, and it's interesting too, Diane, because I've made this comment on the podcast before about there's just certain people and you were one of them. You just meet and you just have an immediate connection. And then frankly, there's other people, maybe it's not a ton, but you meet and then just, yeah, okay, well, listen, nice to meet you. And there just wasn't anything clicking. So there's kind of a synergy there. So so not necessarily to be uh, chronological here, but but back up a little bit and tell a little bit of the Diane McClay journey, because where you are now is so impressive. I didn't know you in the in the previous uh, iterations <laughs> of your life, but certainly with the Forest Service and some of these, tell the listeners kind of some of your background. Yeah, um, thanks for that. So I'll try to keep this short. Uh, you know, the older you get, the longer your story gets, right? True. And there's so many that, things that you can pull into it. Um, The short version is I was, uh, I did, I fell into a dream career as a park ranger and a park manager for a state agency in Oregon and also at the federal level. I did that for half my life, about 25 years. Uh, I knew in first grade, that's what I wanted to do. I was one of those people that, um, you know, when they ask you what you want to be when you grow up, uh, I kind of already knew and I didn't realize that it was as accessible as it was. 
Uh, I had written down firefighter, park ranger, airplane pilot. And then wow. my dad was a fish biologist for the state of Michigan. So I wrote that down because that's what I was familiar with. Um, when I got into college uh, and I was struggling with picking a major, my dad said, did you ever think of parks and recreation? Uh, the answer was no. And as soon as I took my classes in 4.8, I knew it was the place that I wanted to be. So my first grade dream became a reality in college as a major. And as soon as I graduated college, I had to come out to the Pacific Northwest to fulfill an internship. And literally for 25 years, one job right after the another, one job would close, another job would open. And I had just this beautiful journey of always being able to say yes to the next opportunity until uh, there was a challenge in that particular career. And I had to make a really difficult choice about leaving that agency in that career and shifting into something that served me a little bit more, which I did about six years ago. And that's when I started coaching, writing, working for myself, creating a business for myself, and now doing two shows on Transformation Talk Radio. And I'm always curious when there's a, a dramatic change like that. I think sometimes it can shift slowly. It's like, I, I don't know, maybe the grain of sand that turns the thing to the other side or something. But, and I've had people that were, they're going to go to the left Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then they wake up Tuesday, they're going to the right. Was it a big event from you or was it a slow shift that kind of made the change 25 years in the park range and that type of thing? And then to go in such a different direction, did it, how did it, how did the change happen? Honestly, I, I tell a lot of my clients that um, change is going to happen. It, it just is. We can't avoid it. Either we seek it out, like people want to do a career shift, uh, and they plan and strategically on how to move from one job to another, or in some cases, it just, it literally change can land on us without our consent. It can just fall out of the sky. And in, in my case, it sort of fell out of the sky uh, without getting into the details because they're not relevant anymore. Um, there were some things that I didn't do right as a manager. I made some bad decisions. Now they weren't illegal. They weren't unethical. They just didn't fit with the agency's viewpoint on how things should work. Uh, they decided they didn't want me to be in manage any, management anymore. And they offered me a position that was six hours away from my current home and family. So that was, it was a really big dramatic shift. And this is why choice is, it really came into my life. It was like a light bulb. It was like a big aha. What I realized is in that moment, I could allow the agency to make a choice for me and continue a career that was comfortable in pay and comfortable with benefits, but no longer served me or my value system. Or I could make the choice to walk away from that career, knowing that I had achieved a lot of my goals and I had reached what I want to reach. And I could take, I could kind of free myself from the bureaucracy and I can have the autonomy and the creativity that I wanted to have. I could walk away from that career and make the choice to be, um, to work for myself and, and to create my own business, which I opted to do. Right. And a key part of that, as I see for those of those, those of us that can see you on Zoom, are these two key words that become a, a hallmark of Diane McClay, choice and courage. Talk about how that evolved, because there's such powerful disciplines, if you will, and attitudes. Tell me how the choice and courage thing came about. Yeah, again, choice came up when I realized in my heart, in my soul, when I realized that like resigning from my position was literally my choice. That was like, it was like being in a football stadium in the Seahawks stadium and all the floodlights come on. There was so much um, energetic focus on choice. I realized that when it was my choice, I had the power. And, and in a short period of time, what I realized is when my awareness went up, my power went up. When I started creating options for myself, my power went up. And when I made a choice from the options I created, I was almost unstoppable. And, and I'll just give you an example. I knew that I couldn't work for the agency anymore. The, just the level, the value systems were different. And I knew I, I had grown away from some of the things that they uh, wanted me to be regimented to. And so I said, okay, how am I going to make money? And I, I literally listed, this is a challenge for your listeners, four questions. The first thing I listed was, what can I do? And I listed everything. I can paint houses. I can clean gutters. I can pump gas. I can start a chainsaw. I, so what can I do was the first question I asked myself. The second question I asked is, what am I willing to do? So for example, I would be willing to drive 40 in Oregon, you can't pump your own gas. 
So I would be willing to drive 45 miles away to go pump gas at two o'clock in the morning if that's what it took to pay my bills. But I was not willing to stay in a comfortable paid position and set up another household six hours away from my family and my community, mm -hmm. right? So what can I do? What am I willing to do? The next question is, what am I not willing to do? What is absolutely off the table? Now, what I realized is if the bank came knocking to ask me about my mortgage and the bill collectors wanted money from me, there are some things on the I'm not willing to do it ever list that might shift into uh, I'm willing to do it because it's a way to make money, even if it was temporary. Right. So, so that's how I, like, as soon as the choice thing became an aha for me, it was almost instantaneous that, instantaneous that I started building my business around choice. Mm -hmm. And the courage piece comes in is because it takes a lot of courage to step into something that's new, to step into something that is different, uncomfortable, unusual, uh, not what I expected or planned, right? Courage is with all of us, but it, sometimes we really have to dig in and grab onto it in order to propel us forward to the next thing. And that's what I did in this in this particular instance. And I love those questions. What's the fourth question, by the way? The fourth one is uh, I've turned this into a worksheet that people could get. Is the fourth mm. one is when you go back to what what can I do? Mm -hmm. Then what skills are, are, come with each of those things? Oh, okay. so for example, I can start a chainsaw. I can also um, I can take apart a small engine. I can put it back together again. I can sharpen a blade. I can cut. Uh, firewood. I can cut trees. Um, I can. I'm not a chainsaw artist, but if I can clean a chainsaw, I can clean a weed eater. So once you identify what you can do, then you identify what are the extra skills that come with that. Right. So when I run a chainsaw, for example, I can problem solve. I can look at a tree and I can see if it's going to fall on me when I cut it or not. Right. So I can problem solve. I can. Um, work hard, I can start a job and end a job from beginning to end. So now you've built essentially an inventory of what you have to offer other people. And I sort of call this my, it, it may not replace your original income, but it will bring some money in right. if you're in between jobs. Well, I think it's particularly pertinent right now, given sort of we're now post pandemic for the most part after about 18 months. And I think about the amount of people that lost their jobs through the as a result of the pandemic and, a, and all the shutdown of the economy and so forth. And right. so we'll cover that kind of as uh, some takeaways at near the end of the podcast. I think those are four great questions to ask. And so with with the idea of the of choice and courage and, and shifting away after 25 years, was it is that something? How did it come about? I'm going to make a living doing this. Is it something like I've always wanted to help people? How did that evolve in your brain? Yeah, so there was a shift, right? So another one of my podcasts is called the Shift Perspective, uh, perspective in our the, sorry, it's the Shift Podcast, and our uh, perspective and our power to change, and it's the first and third Fridays at twelve thirty. Mm -hmm. What I realize is when you can shift your perspective, when you can stop and create space and ask yourself some questions, you you have a lot of ability to transfer knowledge and skills to a different thing. So when I let go of, I'm a park ranger, I have to take care of the land, I have to connect people to the stewardship message of the agency. What I realize is I, in my, what is true for me? And this is what I ask my clients a lot. What is, tr what has always been true for me? And that is, I have always been compassionate. I have always been a good listener. I have always been able to engage people in good conversation. And this is, these are some of the traits that came out of that list of what can I do? I can facilitate meetings. So if I can facilitate a meeting, it means I can listen to people. I can, I can navigate a difficult conversation or I can get people to meet in the middle and agree on things. So when I created my list of what can I do, and then I grabbed the skills of the hard and soft skills at hard and soft skills for your listener, like running a chainsaw is a hard skill, problem solving would be a soft skill. So once I created this list of everything that I can do and all the skills that come with it, what I realized what was has always been true for me is I like helping people. I like problem solving. 
I feel like I carry a backpack full of belief in anybody I meet. David, if you were to tell me today, I wanna paint a mural on a wall, but I've never painted before in my life. My response to you would be, I absolutely believe you can do it. How can I help you get there? Mm -hmm. Like I have no doubt that you, David, that gratitude guy could paint a mural on the side of a building if you said that's what you wanna do. Mm -hmm. And in the coaching world, you and I both know this, that sometimes we get in our own way, our own belief systems and our fears get in the way of what we wanna do. And I feel like I can just see through those fears and I can help people navigate a path to get them forward. Mm -hmm. That's no different than being a park ranger. People come to the park to have a good time. They can't set up their tent. They don't know how to start a fire. They don't know what the rules are. My job as a park ranger was to be a steward of the land and to interpret the rules and and expectations for the public so they'd be safe and the resources would be protected. Mm -hmm. If I just take out the word park ranger and land, As a coach, an empowerment coach, somebody who believes in choice and courage, I'm just using a similar set of skills in a different capacity. Does that make sense, the way I'm saying it? It does. It does. And speaking of being an empowerment coach, uh, we talked before the podcast about shifting regret and fear, a tremendous aspect of a person's personality to be able to shift regret and fear, uh, two big things that can work against us. How does that happen? How is that possible? How does a person make that shift? I, I think it takes a little bit of work. I mean, some people, they can naturally do it. it for me, um, it's just kind of like breathing. It's just something I do. Uh, let me give you an example. When I, my biggest fear when I left my state park job was answering the question, can we contact your employer and why did you leave? Mm. I was like, man, what do I say? And the reality was, is that they offered me a position that was not ge- uh, geologically convenient to my family. That's Mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, I don't have to go into all the details of all the stories that led to that decision. So when I let go of the fear of what are people going to think about me or how do I answer this honestly without painting a negative picture of myself, when I let go of that, the fear kind of went away. So some people have the, they have a fear of making a bad decision or a wrong decision. The first thing I'm going to say to your audience members is my, one of my missions is to get rid of the binary concept of decision making. Mm. When I say that, it's like, well, is this a good decision or a bad decision? That's binary. Is this um, the right decision or the wrong decision? Sometimes choice is just about making one decision to get to the next place where you get more information mm. about the next decision. Right. Does that make sense? Uh, so absolutely. I was on a trip. Let me give a quick example. I was on a trip. My flight got canceled and the airport was buzzing with angry, frustrated people. Everybody's trying to get their flights changed. I was in Denver and I was coming home to Washington and my partner and I said, okay, what are our options? That's the first way to put power back in is just start creating options for yourself. What, what is possible? right? Then you make a choice. So we said we could pick another flight, but we we have time limitations. We don't want to get bumped again. So we said, okay, what about renting a car? Yes, there's a car available. Yes, we decided to rent it. Yes, we decided to drive out from Denver and drive home. As soon as we made the one decision to get the car and get out of that airport frenzy and that frenetic, frustrated energy, We went and got the car, then we created space for ourselves. Then we were able to say, how long do we want to take to drive home? Where do we want to stop? How many, are we going to shift drivers or just drive straight through? Do you see what I mean? Like one Mm -hmm. decision led to the next decision. So if we could actually make a commitment as a human race to get rid of a good decision and a bad decision, and we just agree you're making a decision. That's it. It's just a decision. It's interesting. If we I got took- out of the, the self-judgment and the, the worry about it, what other people think of us when we make a decision, I think that already sets us on the right path. I was going to say I took a course in college, and I believe it was called decision-making. It might have been a subset of another course at uh, my senior year at the UAW. And, but I just remember so much the professor saying, here, it's really important. Make a decision. Be decisive. So here's the good news. If you make a good decision, that's fantastic. 
if you make a bad decision, you know what you do then? You make another decision. And exactly. so it's exactly right. And it's almost like steps on the, I always think about those um, stair steps in, in the movies where they're doing previews of coming attractions and stuff. And they walk down the stairs and they step out before the next step even appears. And then it right. appears, you know, they're stepping into the abyss or something. So, so important. So any way that a person can kind of be mindful of understanding it's one step at a time and how to kind of keep that as part of their mindset? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, honestly, um, the first question that I would say is, you know, am I, am I trying to make a decision for the future? Now, you just bought a house, right? So there's a lot of steps in the decision-making process. Correct. So the first thing I would say is break a big, gigantic decision down into smaller decisions. First, you had to decide what was in your price range. Then you had to decide what region you want to live in. Then you had to decide if the house you found meets your price range in the region. And then you started saying, well, what am I willing to give and take on now that I found the perfect house? Maybe it's outside of my budget, but what could I do differently? Because I really, really love this house. So instead of saying I need to make the perfect decision in the X amount of time with all of these parameters, check boxes checked, and it, it has to be done, I think when you and I were talking about you buying your house, you said, hey, I, I was looking online. That's kind of a decision-making process. And then you went and drove into a neighborhood. That's a decision make. That's a step in the decision-making process. And then you looked at styles. That's a step. And then you looked at price range or features or appliances or contracts. So I think breaking a big, gigantic decision that feels heavy, uh, fearful, you know, think about what's happening in your body. You know, if you're feeling tense and upset and worried and stressed, then you probably need to take whatever decision you're making and break it into smaller, more manageable pieces. That'd be the first thing. Recognize what's going on in your body. Yeah. You know, and then I want to bring your piece into it, the gratitude. Like use gratitude as a tool to also help you make a decision. I'm grateful that I have a choice. I'm grateful that I have multiple things to work through because as soon as you bring gratitude into the equation, as you talk about all the time, your mindset shifts. It, it opens up your ability to hear uh, new things and you can look at things in a different perspective. Yeah. And I Do you think want to speak to that? Uh, well, I would say something that pops to my mind around that is, uh, I quote this every so often in talks, the five regrets to dine. And there's several things I wish I'd been, I wish these are all people that are 95 plus. I wish I kept better in touch with my friends. I wish I'd lived a life more true to myself than what other people expected for me. But one of the ones that when I think about uh, regret and fear that I, I is maybe my favorite of the five is I wish I'd taken more chances. They're now 95 and it's over. They can't, you know, they can't go do something they wanted to do in their 20s or so on. But I think it's so important. I happen to be a big list maker. And I really resonate with what you're saying because my thing is when somebody calls me and I'm all upset, and, you know, David, I needed to talk to you and so forth. And, and you're, my, you're such a close friend. Can you help me out? Invariably, once you let them vent for a little bit and get there, I say, okay, you got a pad of paper handy? Okay, grab your pad. Let's get a pen. Let's make a list. And so there's just to what you're saying, there's a couple of key things. We're going to make a list. But yep. we then, when we make the list, and I'll tell them sometimes you need to make it over the case over the course of an hour or two or a day or two. Then next step, prioritize it. Number ten should probably be number one. Number two could go down to number twenty and so forth. And then what's third? Take action. And what was it? I heard once they said, "Never leave the site of making a goal without doing something towards its attainment." And so if Diane and David say we're going to host a cup podcast, okay, when I hang up, I'm going to call TTR and see if they have the slot available for us. Take some action. But yep. I think the, the making the list is so important. I was lamenting the other day that I'm a big list person. I'm making notes of, of so many things that Diane's saying on the podcast and so forth. I'll be talking to people that just like, I got to write that down. That's really good. I like that, you know, and so on. And then I'll look at them. Do you like ever take notes or did you just remember everything I'm saying? Or you just kind of, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe they do. I don't know. But it's like, I got to write it down and then I can, you know, rearrange it. And I wanted to be a pilot. I want to be a park ranger. I want to be, you know, these things. I can't, I got to make notes of those things and I want to create positive change. You know, so it's, it's interesting. I think some people just need the guidance, but I think yeah. there is a great saying and I'm trying to remember, but when we think of regret and fear and there's something about somebody would rather live with regrets than the fear of never taking a chance at all or it was something like that type of thing and stuff so let, let's touch base touch on just real quickly creating positive change what are some of the steps that somebody say well gee diane i want to create positive change in my life 
uh, what are some of the steps you might mention to them? Yeah. So let's, let's, let's stick with regret. That's mm -hmm. kind of a, let's, right. let's start with regret. Mm -hmm. I believe that if you have a regret, oh, I wished I had done this while I'm living and breathing. And while I'm still physically able to move through the world, I believe that regret spurs the opportunity to create a new alternative. I, I believe that regret creates opportunity. So for example, there's a there was a lot, an open vacant lot across my from my house that was open for a while. And I have, first of all, I try not to live with regret, but I have a regret I didn't buy that lot because it could have been a nice studio, creative spot for me, super accessible to my house, all that. Now that I know that I wished I had bought that lot, it opens my mind to maybe I wish, maybe I would like to have a place to store all my outdoor toys or a place to have a personal studio. So now, instead of regretting I didn't buy the lot, I actually look for opportunities that might fulfill that goal that I had. So how do you, so the question is, how do you, um, sorry, say it to me again, because I think I just lost it. The, you uh, how do we shift out of regret I think maybe two or the steps rather from the creating positive change. And you said, let's focus on regret. Yeah. Okay. So one, try not to have regret. Two, if you have regret, identify what it is you would change if you could do it again and start working towards that. Okay. But you also asked me about how, what are the steps to creating positive change or Correct. positive choice? I think you can say very simply, does this move me towards my goal or does it not? Mm. Does this make me happy or does it not? Does it meet my value system or does it not? I, I think those are three, like I talk about removing the binary part of choice for fear and right and wrong, but it is a motivator to say, I'm either moving towards my goal or I'm not. Right. And if I'm not moving towards my goal, what is within my control to start making a change? Mm -hmm. Our attitude, how we look at things, perspective, you know, reading a book, we, I think you said it, taking action, even if it's small, is really critical to making a positive change. Mm -hmm. So my example of the airport was just an angry buzz of really upset people. I made a choice to step aside, get out of line and create space so that I could think. Then I made a choice to do something that benefited me, which was, hey, I'm not going to rely on the service agent to figure this out for me. I'm going to figure out some options for myself, and I'm going to pick an option out of my deck that regardless of what option I come with, I can live with it. Mm -hmm. So I think the steps to positive change, I think it, it really comes down to generating awareness is step one. What, what do you wish changes? What, do you, what kind of a change needs to happen? And it could be something as simple as, am I happy or am I not? Right. As soon as you have awareness, you have power and you have information. Mm -hmm. Step two is you create options. All right. If I'm not happy in this situation, what are my options that could make me happier? I could rent a car. I could get a different flight. I could ask a friend to pick me up. I could go rent a hotel. And then it comes back to what you said. You can prioritize those options one way or the other, right. or you take action and you just pick one and you move forward because you're going to know if that decision or that choice you're going to know if it moves you forward or if it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. just going to know. And then you'd mentioned earlier too, before the show about uh, making choices about doing a podcast by the side of the road. I think there was something <laughs> along that line. That was, tell the listeners about that. That was cool. Yeah. So I had this dream when I started my own business that I would be able to travel and do whatever I wanted. And I'd have this life of leisure and I could just do coach and I could do podcasting and writing from whatever you know destination I was at. And I had the, because I made the decision to rent the car, uh, then I had to decide how can I make sure I have a good internet service to meet the requirements of podcasting with Transformation Talk Radio. And what I realized is I could hotspot my cell phone, I could link my computer to my cell phone, and we, we literally pulled over at a rest area on the border of Idaho and Utah. And there was this dirt road behind the rest area and it didn't say I couldn't go there. So I drove back out of traffic noise and where I couldn't hear truck brakes and all that. 
I backed the rental car up to this beautiful backdrop of uh, juniper, uh, juniper trees, sage, you know, tall desert grasses, pop the lid, pop the, the rear uh, trunk open of the car and put a piece of a cloth over the top to keep it from being too sunny. Plug my laptop into my phone, plug my microphone into my laptop. Voila, now my dream of having freedom and autonomy and creativity that I didn't get when I worked at the park service, it's literally coming to life, literally on the side of the road. That's cool. Right. So if I had not if I had not made a decision to rent a car, I wouldn't have had that experience. Exactly. exactly. Does that make sense? So to me, it's wow. like six years ago, I could not have predicted that I would have had that experience. But right. I can absolutely tell you every event and every choice I have made from when I left my job led to that experience. Yeah. But it also reminds me, too, of, of the lemon in the lemonade. I mean, it just depends on, and one of the things that you and I connected right away is very positive. I, mean, I just can't imagine you and, hi, Diane. Hi, David. Hi, Diane. How are you? Hi, David. How are you? I mean, you just, we're, just, we're just energetic people. And, we, and there's just, there's yeah. a lot in the, in the smile on our face. And positive. I mean, every day is perfect. Of course not. But there's something about it. There's just a level of energy. So that's lemon into lemonade. The lemon, I'm going to figure out a way to make this better. And so I'm going to get a little cloth to protect from the sun. We're going to back into this dirt road and so on and so forth. So Right. That's and that's, the, that's positive choice, right? Absolutely. I, I could be like, oh man, I didn't think about how to set this up. Yeah. Or I could be like, what do I have that I can make this work? Right. And, you know, um, I mean, yeah. MacGyver is one of my heroes, duct tape, a tube sock, a pocket knife exactly. and some MacGyver. string and some That's candle true. wax and the guy can build an airplane. Exactly. You know, it's interesting too, when you were saying about regret, uh, I've met people that have said, I don't have a regret in my entire life. And, and, and I just, I've always been one of these people that I would say, there's a lot of things I don't regret that is part of my life. If I hadn't taken a left on that road, I'd not be sitting here talking to Diane today. But right. the one regret that I do have is just where I've hurt people. And that, that's a tough one where sure. some of the jobs I was in as a manager and things. And I just, I regret that. But other than that, um, you don't want to hurt people as part of your daily life. You want to go out and make a good contribution and so forth. But well, listen, we got to wrap up in about three or four minutes. I want to try to just recap a couple of the things that you said, which I think are sure. great takeaways. And uh, feel free to jump in on any of these you want. But I like this. I love the four questions to ask yourself. What can I do? Because I think about, again, the people that are unemployed right now making a shift uh things have changed because of the pandemic they've lost their job uh you got we have a ter terrible homeless problem so a lot of those are people that have lost their jobs and so forth but what can i do what am i willing to do is question number two what am i not willing to do i told somebody after a long career in retail i don't think i'll ever say it again may i help you <laughs> <laughs> did that for a long time. Uh, but then the one I thought was really cool, they all are good. But number four, what skills come with each thing that I can do? And you listed out as an example, some of your skill sets. I think it's very important for the listeners to think about this compassionate, good listener, teaching people, communicator, problem solver, likes people, kind of be aware, take an inventory of your attributes. And what that goes back to what can I do versus, you know, it's, it might take 10 years to go through medical school, I probably don't want to do that. So that's something on the, I'm not willing to do that right now. So I think that's really important. And then when we were talking about kind of the decision making, what are our options? Number one, make another decision or a choice. Number two, keep being decisive. It's so important to be decisive. Like that professor said to me, is it's the worst thing in the world is be indecisive. If you make a good decision, great. If you don't, make another one. And that's so, so very important. So um, anything to add to that, Diane? I love those, some of those things that you mentioned. One of my favorite quotes uh, is by um, Henry Ford, and he says that um, failure is the opportunity to start again more intelligently. Mm. And I think that if we let go of the old version of what failure looks like, and we just say, you know, if something doesn't work out the way I hoped or planned, mm -hmm. I now have more information to, to, to advise me or to guide me on the next thing that I'm doing. And I want to come back to your regret thing where you said, yeah, I agree with you about nobody, you know, if you have a regret about hurting somebody, um, you know, it's, yes, it's good you have that regret, but coming back to choice and courage, it takes courage to acknowledge that, yes, you were, maybe you didn't live up to your own personal expectations, or maybe you, you've grown a lot since you were, you know, an 18 year old, but now you have the choice, you know, with your business and with your show, that gratitude guy, I would imagine that that gratitude is one of the things that helps you mitigate that regret. Oh, absolutely. In, 
right? In my past, I might've hurt somebody. So now I'm committed to giving good information, supporting people, being positive, all the things we've talked about today. So if you have a little bit of a regret, then you, while you're living and breathing and you're still a functional human being in this new earth, then you get to fix that regret right. by taking positive action and making positive choices. Yeah, that's such a good point too. And then one last uh, takeaway, uh, you had three questions. Does this make me happy? Does this get me towards my goal? What was the third one? Uh, is it connected to my value system? Value system. That's Whatever right. that means to, for somebody. Which is different for each of the two. So right. excellent. Well, listen, uh, one more question, and then I'm going to get to the end of the show here. I so appreciate you being on That Gratitude Guy podcast. I always end every show with this question. I never ask somebody their age, but whatever age you are right now, and you only get to pick one thing, what do you know today you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you that you know today when you back when you were 18? One thing and one thing only. So if I were to advise my, if my older self were to advise my younger self of what I've learned in my journey. Yep. The one um, thing that would help you. I think it's that I have more power than I'm led to believe or that I've been told by mm. family or society or by my employer. That I really think it comes down to we have more choice than what we think we do. That's great. I really like that. Gratitude. That's a great question, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And gratitude believers, that's a great comment by Diane, have more power than I believe or thought was possible. I think something that kind of ties into this gratitude helps your self-esteem, your self-confidence, your self-awareness. And when you're focusing on what you have in your life versus what you don't have, gratitude turns what you have into enough. It makes a big difference. And one of the things is I would think that we many people are underpowered. Maybe that's a word, just like a motor or something. Uh, we don't even understand our own power to have more a belief in the power that you have and the choices and things that you can do in your life. And it's just it's so incredibly important because I think a lot of where people suffer is with a lack of self esteem, and they make choices that just aren't that good. Is because they don't feel as good about the person in the mirror. So, well, again, Diane, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. And let me just tell everybody as we wrap up here. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and any other places you find podcasts. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. Purchase a gratitude journal and find out more about my gratitude speaking, coaching, one-on-one -on -one group coaching. You can connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com. Also, a lot of people ask me about the Monday morning minute. I send out every Monday morning at six in the morning. If you'd like to receive the Monday morning minute, go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's a five-digit number, 22828. And in the message box, put in gratitude guy, and they will send you a link and you can get that um, uh, Monday morning minute. And one last thing, an exclusive for all my podcast listeners, I'm offering my six-month proprietary gratitude coaching program that can transform your life for the three-month price. And all you have to do is email me at david at thatgratitudeguy.com and tell me you heard about it on the podcast, and I'll get you squared away. So finally, thanks again for tuning in. Another great guest. I'm so happy to have Diane on the show. And until next time, I'm David George Brook, That Gratitude Guy. Remember, be grateful. And never and give up. And never quit. That's close enough. Thanks, <laughs> Diane. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today. 